Good morning, everyone. It's time to begin our service. Let's all stand. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms in here. It's always great to begin our service with worship. Worship is the key, I believe, to bring us into God's presence and to open up our hearts to receive what he has for us today. And I believe that the more we give ourselves to worship, um, the more it puts us in a position to receive from him. And um, so, Father, we just come to you this morning and we just thank you that you are here in the midst of us and you have a great plan for our service today. You want to speak to us. So we open up our hearts to receive from you, Jesus. But first, we want to worship you. And God, I just thank you that as each one of us give ourselves to worship, as we worship you with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength, God, that, that uh, it, will be, it will be a blessing to you. And I, I always say, God, that because you are such a giving God, you are going to minister back to us today. And so, God, we just thank you for what's going to be accomplished in our midst today. If you're in agreement, we all say... Why should I fear man when you made the heaven? Why should I be afraid when you put the stars in play? Why should I lose heart when I know how great you are? Why should I give up when your plans are full of love? In this world we will have trouble, but you have overcome the world.
I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise, and treasures that fade are never enough. But then you came along and put me back together. I was now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than. Turn bones into armies. Turn seas 
afternoon. She's in the hospital at Upper Chesapeake. Pastor Mike and I will be going over to uh, pray with her and the family. And uh, Nellie is 96. I believe she'll be 97 in June. And so Nellie, if you're listening to this, if Sharon's got the phone up to your ear, I believe she probably does. We love you. This church family loves you. And Father God, we just speak healing 
to our sister from the top of her head to the soles of her feet we just thank you that she breathes deep the breath of god father god i thank you that the spirit of death pain sickness and disease and infirmity is far from that room right now 221 in the name of jesus and it leaves it rushes down the corners and leaves that hospital you are not allowed to attach yourself to anything or anyone in the name of jesus christ the anointed one we plead the blood of jesus over that room right now we plead the blood of jesus over the family father god we release our faith and join our faith right now we believe that we don't have to be sick to go home and be with the lord and father god we just speak life and life abundantly to nelly who is 96 years young in the name of jesus we give you glory we give you honor and praise lord jesus of nazareth the one true jesus and Father God, we thank you for anybody else in the hospital right now that needs that healing touch, Lord. We pray for all those with pain, sickness, disease, and infirmity. We pray for Linda's grandson, Justin, Lord. We continue to hold him up in prayer for his miracle from the top of his head to the soles of his feet, Lord. We thank you for a complete healing on this young man. We thank you for all those that need that touch right now. We thank you, Father God. That when it's time for us to go home and be with the Lord, this is the way I feel we can do it. Just sit back in our favorite chair, close our eyes, and go home and be with Jesus. I've had three strong women of faith in my family that have done that. My grandmother and two aunts. And that's what I'm believing for. I am not going home sick in the name of Jesus. I'm going to be healthy and strong, and I'm going to be occupying this earth the way Jesus said we're supposed to do. I believe he could come soon, but I'm not walking around with my head up in the clouds because he said, occupy till I come. So I occupy. You know what that means, church? That means we go forth. And anybody that Jesus brings across our path, we speak boldly and accurately the word of God to them. And we help to bring them into a full and clear knowledge of the word of God. Amen? Amen! To those of you at home, Father God, I just ask that you would just touch them right now. Lord, touch and strengthen them right now by the power of your might. In Jesus' precious name. I see someone all hooked up to oxygen. I speak life and life abundantly. I say breathe deep the breath of God. Hallelujah. Until you go back to the doctor, keep the oxygen on. When he says you can take it off, you say, thank you, Jesus. I know I've been breathing deep the breath of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We seal up this time with your precious blood. And we thank you, Lord Jesus of Nazareth, the one true Jesus. You are welcome in this place today to do your good works and to take care of every challenge that we brought here, every burden. Dorothy shared that God is here today. The angels of the Most High God are encamped round about us, guarding us, keeping us, warring on our behalf. Lord, we pray for our nation, that there are link angels round about the borders of our nation and warring angels over us, guarding and keeping this nation safe and that we will be one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. So be it. Hallelujah. Um, the Lord just started giving me some words of knowledge, so if this is you, let us know. If you're watching from home, you can comment. Um, but I feel like there's somebody that either watching or here that is dealing with um, or has dealt with chronic earaches. Like either they're experiencing chronic earaches or because of chronic earaches, they've had some challenges with their hearing. And God just wants to heal that so you can just touch. <laughs> I don't know why, but I hear the Lord saying, touch, touch it with your right hand. 
touch your ear with your right hand so we just thank you father god for that we thank you father god for that healing going forth um there's someone that's dealing with some knee pain and so we just thank you father god i think it's the left knee so we just thank you father god for healing that right now in the name of jesus we thank you god for healing um ankles um uh it just hearing ankles cracking in, 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 in my ear right now. So we just thank you, Father God, for healing ankles. We thank you, Father God, for healing backs. I thank you, Father God, for um, healing a, like a slip disc in the neck. So we just thank you, Father God, for that. We thank you, Father God, for that. We thank you, Father God, for that. I just hear the Lord saying that for those that have been dealing with anxiety or depression, that he is releasing uh, uh, his love and his joy right now and we know <laughs> we know that his perfect love casts out all fear we know that he turns our mourning into dancing and in his presence is fullness of joy so we, he's releasing love and joy to combat for everything that the enemy tries to throw at us god has something that combats it so for depression and anxiety he has love and he has joy and so we just thank you for releasing that right now in Jesus name, in Jesus name, in Jesus name. I, there's somebody that's dealing with some breathing problems and um, that may actually be what's contributing to the anxiety. So we just speak to your lungs and we call your body into alignment with the word of God that says you are whole, that you breathe deep the breath of God, breathe deep the breath of God. We just thank you, Father God, for that. And um, I think this is the last one. I, 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 there's someone that's dealing with some tooth pain. So we just speak healing. We speak healing. I've heard many testimonies of people getting cavities filled by the Lord. So we just speak healing. We speak healing. We speak healing in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father. Father God, we just thank you for your goodness. It's so good to be back with you. Pastor Mike and I missed you all. And uh, we had a good time with uh, Pastor Don and Tammy's church in Virginia two weeks ago. And we, we so missed you all. For, we came back and we quarantined ourselves for two weeks. And we're glad to be out of quarantine. Thank God if we're healthy and whole and everything's fine. Nothing manifested. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all the prayers. And um, uh, God is so good. Amen. Amen. But he was starting to get a little grouchy on me last Sunday. He was trying to be good. So we watched the service. And then we went outside. And I had him grill some stuff because I thought maybe, you know, how you guys are. Maybe that would help. Fed him a little. Got rid of the hangriness. And then he mowed the grass. He, he just couldn't think of what to do with himself on Sunday. So he'd already mowed it once that week. But hey, you know, God's good. You do what you got to do. So God's good. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings this morning. If you need an envelope, they're in the back. You can put your tithes. When you walk back there, just pray over it, and plop it in, and we will do a corporate prayer. But you worship the Lord. Amen. With the first fruits of your increase, the tithe, he's the one that allows us to get up out of bed and go to work every day. He's the one that has provided for us during this time. And he's provided for us well, hasn't he, church? Amen. And God's been so good and blessed us all. So our scripture this morning. By the way, I just want to say thank you to the worship group. Oh, my goodness. Were we so blessed? Poor Jess got that dumped on her that, that first week. He called me at 630 and says, uh, just got a text from one of the pastors. Uh, they, they've got COVID, and we were with them. And I'm like, get out of the building now. <laughs> And it was a half an hour before worship. It was like, anybody there with you? And he's like, no. I'm like, don't talk to anybody. So he, you talk about God protecting you. So he gets in the car, 
and did a tag team on the phone with Jess. It's, it's on you. And she did excellent. The worship group, you all did excellent. Katie did an excellent sermon. Last week, Michael did an excellent sermon. And this, the, the worship, again, was so good last week and again this week, I have to say. Um, God is so good. You all made us so blessed. And, and I want to say proud, but not in a haughty, nasty way. You know what I mean? Just in a, a God is good kind of way. And when you can feel the anointing, I knew the anointing was getting on Jess. I could hear the quiver in her voice. I thought, uh-oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> and so God is so good. Unless you've ever had the anointing come on you strong like that, the, um, you won't understand. But sometimes it's hard to stand mm -hmm. under the strong anointing and the presence of God. And so I just i am so grateful for a good church family. So those of you that are at home, we uh, miss you and welcome. Come on back whenever you can. We're still socially distanced here. We're still being wise. And uh, we just welcome you back. But there is something about the corporate anointing that you cannot get when you're at home. You can feel it a little bit. And I always put my hand on the screen and, you know, it, it, you can feel it a little bit. But there's something about the presence of God. I'm telling you, when we come together. So Proverbs 6, 3 says, Commit your works to the Lord, all your tasks and activities. Put God in charge of your plans, and you will be successful in carrying them out to completion. Amen? No stopping in the middle. We complete what God has called us to do. Whether it be in the natural realm, he anoints us, or in the physical realm or the spiritual realm, we do that which he's called us to do in completion and honor. And our confession? Lord, I commit all my work to you, to your care, your providence, and your sovereign will and way. I roll my burden of concern into your hands. I lay everything down before you. I leave the outcome with you. By faith, I rest my soul, and I give today with confidence in your care and provision, knowing my future is in your hands. Now, Father God, we stand firm on your word and this confession, and we give you glory and honor for what you're doing in the hearts and the lives of individuals. Therefore, we keep our eyes on you, the author and finisher of our faith, knowing that you see us through no matter what's going on in this world. We have a covenant with you. And we give our tithe, the tenth of our, our increase to you each week. And we stand firm on your word and you multiply that. Yes. And Lord, you rebuke the devourer for our sake. And you cause us to prosper and be in good health even as our soul prospers. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Sometimes, Pastor Mike and I, when we need a breakthrough in our life, and I'll just say this during the offering time, we, we ask God, where can we sow some seed you know, whether it's it, it, depending on what we're needing and we we sow seed, we might give an extra offering and all just to um, bless, you know, not that God needs the money, but it's an, as an act of our will, because how many of you know, if you leave it in your account, you're going to blow it on something and nine times out of 10 is going to be a toy that you really don't need or more, more things that we don't need. We have so many things in life, don't we? But God wants to bless us. And these are ways you either leave, live a kingdom life, a life according to the kingdom of God, or you live it according to our dictates of our flesh. And our flesh can always say, feed me more. Give me more. I want more. Do we need more? No. A life of simplicity is really good. Do I like nice things? Of course I do. I like nice things. And I have nice things. I've got jewelry. I, I don't have enough fingers to wear everything. I've got, you know, we've got two cars. They're older, but they're good cars. They're the kind of cars we like to drive. We've got a beautiful home. We've got this, that, and the other. But the scriptures say we live within our means, and so we try to do that, and we are able to bless others. Amen? 
We always have something to give when there's always a need. So I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know who that's for, but sometimes we just need that gentle reminder to know we're not in line with this world's system. We do our best. We do what we have to do. But I'm lined up with God's kingdom. I'm blessed beyond measure. Because for years, our whole entire marriage, we've served God. We served God when we ate hot dogs all week. We served God when we ate three for a dollar pot pies all week. And we serve God now that we can eat whatever we want to eat. Amen? Amen. And sometimes I just want a good old hot dog. Amen. Amen? Amen. And some chili. Okay. That's a, that's a debate, what you eat on your hot dog. All right, we'll move on. Um, So this past year with the whole COVID stuff, our, uh, our company last year said no raises, no bonuses, no, no nothing, no new jobs, no rehiring if somebody left, that kind of stuff. This past week, um, my boss came, called me, I think it was Wednesday, and, or he asked, we were on a meeting, asked if I could stay on, and I was like, this isn't good. So, <laughs> but he, he's like, I just sent you an email. And I'm like, okay, I opened it up, and um, they apparently, they said they had done some market assessments on some jobs and things like that. They, they did a market assessment on my job and gave me a $9,000 raise this past week. So I, I was blown away and shocked. And um, I also got a bonus this, a couple months ago too when they said there was no bonuses and things like that too. So, and I've worked from home, worked from home this entire time. So yeah, praise God. And working from home in your pajamas. We're gonna trust it's pajamas you wear. We don't wanna hear no more. Ah, that is, uh, thank you for sharing that. Awesome. That is God. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. And God is not a respecter of persons. He, if he does it for one, he'll do it for all of us. Amen. Because our, we, we have our, our finances lined up with him. It's a joy to do things in the kingdom, not just this world situation. Amen. Amen. All right, children's workers, you can go to the back. And um, any other announcements next week? Uh, Brian? That was a great uh, testimony, Mike. Good to hear. Hey, uh, good morning, VFF family. Just a reminder, next Sunday is our church picnic. And uh, there's a still a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Please just put your name down if, you're, if you plan to attend so we have a uh, good head count. Uh, so, you know, we're going to order the food, okay? Um, I think that's it, though. But, and I'll make another uh, uh, announcement after church next week. But, yeah, hope you can join. Looking okay. forward to it, okay? We'll be outside. Amen. <laughs> Going to have a good time. Amen. All right, Pastor Mike. Now, let's hope you don't go too long because it's, it's been like three weeks since he's preached. So suck it up, people. Say big amens, and he might let us go, kind of, you know. <laughs> All right. Amen. <laughs> I, I do want to encourage everybody to stay for the picnic next week. Um, please sign up. It's just a good time of fellowship, and we just want to spend some time with you. Um, we, we don't get enough of it in the church service. You know, this, our church services, you know, most church services aren't designed for fellowship. And so just please stay, and, and um, we'll have plenty of food, and uh, we're going to have a great time. So are you ready for the word this morning? Um, Father, I just thank you for your presence, and I thank you that you do have a word for us this morning, and we open up our hearts to receive it. And God, as always, I ask you to help me to minister this word in boldness and clarity. God, help me to, I, I just, I want the Holy Spirit to speak through me as, as he speaks to us. And so we give this time to you in Jesus' name. You know, I, I'm, I'm reading through the Bible again this year, and I, I typically do that, and I, and I do it in different translations usually each year. And um, <clears throat> I, I read the Word when I, I do my 
um, Bible reading in the morning when I get up. I do other study at, at other times in the Word, you know, for sermons and things like that, and just for my own enrichment. But in the mornings is when I do that um, Bible reading, and, um, and then I have some time of prayer. Um, and I, I made up my own Bible reading program because I wanted it um, on, for six days instead of seven. And I do that because on Sunday mornings, you know, I, I, I get up and, and I'm studying and going over my notes and praying for the, for the sermon. And so, obviously, last week, being in quarantine, we um, did not, I didn't have any assigned Bible reading, and I didn't have any notes to go over for a sermon because I wasn't preaching this past Sunday. But I, I uh, so I got up, and I just felt like the, the Holy Spirit directed my attention to Isaiah chapter 54, and I kept hearing the word barren, barren and um and i knew that this was something that the lord wanted to speak to me but he wanted to speak to us as well and so isaiah 54 begins in verse 1 by saying by saying sing o barren you who have not born break forth in the singing and cry aloud you who have not labored with child for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married one woman says the lord now, that's an interesting verse to share on Mother's Day, right? Um, this seems to be written to a woman who has not born any children, does not have any children. So, now obviously we know that this was written to Israel. It is a prophetic picture of Israel as a nation. And so the barrenness that, that the prophet is speaking of is what Israel is going through as they move from Egyptian captivity and then uh, now they're in Babylonian captivity. So it was a time where um, they were not fruitful in themselves. They were, they were under the lordship of a, of a wicked other nation. And so God was speaking to them about restoring their nation, their freedom, and their fruitfulness. But I, I believe that this Scripture is, is a pro prophetic picture, has a prophetic application for us today. And I really sense that the Lord is speaking to each of us this morning concerning our barrenness. And I really speak that, uh, mean, believe that that means that it's speaking of a lack of fruit in our life. And, and that can be fruit in a lot of different areas. Um, you know, we, we, we long to live fruitful lives no matter... And, and no matter what we try, it just seems that, you know, we, we, we have a lot of labor, we come up empty, or all of the effort that we've put into something yields very little fruit. And that can be just extremely frustrating, you know, because you do all that you know to do and nothing happens, or you do all you know to do and very little happens. And, and in a sense, you can see the fruitfulness that other people are experiencing. And so, you, you can just have this challenge in your heart. So I, I believe that this is speaking to us individually this morning, but also we can apply it to our, our, our church. Before I get into the prophetic application, I want to set this up by looking at the condition of the woman that Isaiah is speaking about. You know, the, the picture that Isaiah describes is of a barren woman. And in that day, a woman's worth was based upon her having children. A woman's worth was based upon her having children and having a husband that could give her children, right? It's, it's different today. You know, people uh, wait longer to get married and then they wait even longer to have children if they want children. You know, it, it's not the same as it was back then. I, I, I know my son just turned 38 last month and his oldest child is seven and I was thinking about that when I was 38 Katie my oldest child was 17 and and I thought wow I'm too young to have a 17 year old granddaughter you know and, and so they waited 10 years longer than really than what we did between the marriage and having children and, and many couples are that way when I was young, most of the couples were getting married very early. I share with you before about, um, especially because there was such a, a, a strong teaching on end times, 
that young couples wanted to get married and have children because they just figured God was going to come any day and they, and they just they just wanted to get married and so um, but it's different today people wait longer things are different even than it was 50 years ago but especially in Old Testament times and, and there are many couples that choose not to have children for whatever reason and, and there's no blame to that there's no fault to that So today, a woman's worth is not based on having children, but in Old Testament times, it was. And not just having children, but having lots of children. The more children they had, the more valuable they were to husbands. Uh, A lot of that had to do with they lived in a society where agriculture was prevalent, and so they needed children to help with the farm work, and, and, and that's the way it was in this country many years ago you know, when most people were farmers. And so they had a lot of children. They, they had a lot of uh, work to get done. So here in Isaiah 54, the woman is called barren and desolate. So barren is unable to have children and desolate means she has no husband. One trans, uh, translation that I was reading said that she had been deserted. Another translation said that she was a widow. So in either case, This woman had no ability to produce children on her own, nor did she have a husband to supply the seed necessary to conceive. And perhaps even now she was too old to bear children. All right, so we can see this prophetic picture of a barren woman. Now, throughout the scripture, we find examples of barren women. And in these, we see the anguish they experienced not being able to have children. Probably the most famous is Sarah. Sarah was Abraham's wife, and even though God had told Abraham that he was going to have children, Abraham and Sarah tried to have children, but she was barren. And so after 15 years of, after the prophecy of trying to have children, you know, Sarah told Abraham to take, take her servant girl and to have a child with her. In people's eyes, since Hagar was Sarah's servant, the child that Hagar bore would be considered Sarah's. And so, you know, sometimes we try to um, figure out how God's going to do something, and then we do things on our own, and, and, and most of the time we mess that up. But I'm sure that Sarah was thinking, part of her thought process was, maybe that's what God meant. All right, that's what God meant. But I think there was another reason for doing that. And I think it was the fact that by giving Hagar to Abraham, if Hagar did not get pregnant, then it would show the world that the reason why she was barren was not her fault, but it was Abraham's fault. So I think there was an ulterior motive in what she did and giving Hagar to Abraham. And we know the story. Abraham goes into Hagar. They have a child. And then um, later on, God just reminds Abraham and Sarah, look, the child that I had promised you is coming through you. And so at the age of 90, Sarah had Isaac. And so her barrenness was ended. And um, sometimes when we think about Sarah, sometimes... We want to blame others for our lack of fruit, and sometimes we even blame God. All right? Now, it's really interesting that when you look at the promised line, that barrenness seemed to run in that, in that line. Because you had Sarah, she had Isaac. Isaac gets married to Rebekah, and um, he gets married at the age of 40, And they tried for 20 years to have a child, but Rebecca was barren. Genesis 25, 21 says, Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebecca, his wife, conceived. So she had Jacob and Esau. So they tried for 20 years, and finally she has children. And we know the story. Jacob tricks Esau into selling him his birthright, and then he steals the firstborn blessing, and then he flees to his uncle's house because he figured Esau was going to kill him. And and we know the story when he gets there. He falls in love with Rachel, and 
he works for seven years. He works out a deal with her father, Laban, and he works for seven years for Rachel's hand in marriage. And I still don't quite understand what happened, but he marries this woman he thinks is Rachel, and he goes in, and the next morning he realizes that it wasn't Rachel. I, I think he must have had a lot to drink or something. I don't know. But the next morning he wakes up, and it's not Rachel. It's Leah. And so he goes to Laban and says, look, I worked for you seven years for Rachel, and you gave me Leah. And, of course, Laban says, well, the first child gets married first. And so, and, and so they worked out another deal where he would work seven more years for Rachel. He really wanted that woman. And so after, and it wasn't that he had to wait seven years because after fulfilling the honeymoon week, he was given Rachel, but then he had to work seven years for her. So really he got Rachel on credit, okay? So then what happens is that Leah bears Jacob four sons, but Rachel is barren. And there's no question whose fault it is because Jacob has fathered four sons already. So Rachel knows it's her. And Genesis chapter 30, it says, Now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister, and she said to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. I mean, that statement, I, I can just imagine that conversation that they were having. It was not a calm conversation. It was a pouring out of the heart from a woman who was just desperate to have children. And she was at the point of, you know, if you don't give me children, I'm going to die. I'm worthless. I'm worthless. And so Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel. And he said, am I the, in the place of God who has withheld you from the fruit of the wound? And she said, here's my maid Bilhah. Go into her and she will bear a child on my knees that I also may have children of, by her. So she takes Sarah's um, a, a, a example in the mind and approach. So she gives Bilhah to Rachel and or to, to Jacob and, and Jacob has two children with her and then Leah hasn't had any children lately and so she gives her uh, servant Zilpah to, 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 to Jacob and he has two children with her. And then Rachel ends up having two more children and all of this time, or excuse me, Leah had two more children. All this time Rachel is still barren. And you can imagine the anguish that's in her soul after all of this time. Four, then two, then two, then two. What's that mean? Ten. Thank you. Ten children. And she has none. And then we know that God opened her wound and she had two children. She had Joseph and she had Benjamin and she died when Benjamin was born. In Judges 13, we find the story of Samson's mom being barren and crying out to God for a child and Samson is born. The other story that I want to look at is of a barren woman. I want to look at the story of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And it says, now there was a certain man of Ramathium Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim and his name was Elkanah, the son of Je Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. Thank God for Mikes and Jims and <laughs> Carls and, you know. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, it, it was customary, but, it, but not sanctioned by God, for a man to take a second wife when his first wife was barren. So based on that custom, I'm thinking that Hannah was the first wife. And so Elkanah, you know, they tried to have children, they couldn't and needed children, so he marries this other woman. And verse 3 says that this man went up from the city, his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. And I don't really know how many there were. 
But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. So it's interesting to me that Elkanah gave to Hannah a double portion. That meant that he was treating her as if she had the eldest son who would have received the double portion allotted to the heir. Think about that. So I don't know if he knew what he was doing, but he was sowing into the vision even when it looked impossible. And her arrival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. And so it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord and she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. So there is typically rivalry between the wives and it was a, a lot of it had to do with how many children they gave to the husband. Hannah's rival, Peninnah, provoked Hannah not so much to make her angry but to cause her inner turmoil and anguish and she probably reminded Hannah of how much more valuable she was to Elkanah. And then Hannah, then Hannah was because she had given him children. And we know that Hagar did the same thing to Sarah when she bore Ishmael. And Sarah could not conceive. Verse 7 says that the Lord had closed her wound. And a woman in the Old Testament times who could bear no children was viewed as cursed by God. All right, so everything was blamed on God, whether it was God or not. All right, Verse 8, Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Now, the last line was the husband's futile attempt to bring comfort to her breaking heart. I don't know about you, but as a husband... When my wife has been upset, very upset about something, you want to say something that brings comfort and you end up saying something stupid. Amen. <laughs> and what Alcana said was stupid. Amen. <laughs> and I think Hannah probably wanted to slap him at that Amen. moment. Because it was not about him. It was about Amen. a child. It was about her wanting to have a child. And, you know, and so husbands, I, I, give you, I, I give you credit for trying, but sometimes it's best, you know, well, we try to keep our mouth shut, but then we get in trouble for not saying anything. Don't you care? Yes, I care, but if I say something, I'm in trouble. If I don't say something, I'm in trouble. If I say something, I'm in trouble. You don't know what goes through our minds. It's just this horrible thing. <laughs> Hannah was so distraught when they went that she just cried out to God and she wasn't crying out loud. It was just all this inner turmoil and she would stay after the offerings were made and, and she would move her mouth but she wasn't saying anything but there was anguish in her heart and Eli the high priest would be sitting there and he would watch her and he thought she was drunk. And he told, basically told her to go home. Why are you so drunk? And then when she explained that she was not drunk, but that she was just having agony of soul and spirit and the reason why she was having that, Eli answered and said to her, go in peace and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. I don't know, maybe somebody's watching today that's been trying to have a child. And, and I just say what Eli said to her, go in peace. And the God of gods, great God Almighty, grant the petition that you have asked of him. Verse 19, then they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. That's a biblical term for, you know. And the Lord remembered her. And so it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and she called his name Samuel saying, because I have asked for him from the Lord. Now the phrase the Lord remembered does not imply that he's forgotten, but rather that he is now going to bring his answer to Hannah's prayer and unfold his purposes. 
So through these examples, we can see the anguish and heartbreak of being barren. Proverbs chapter 30, two verses there just really speak very loudly in this area. It says, the leech has two daughters. Give, give, they cry. There are three things that are never satisfied, four that never say enough. The grave, the barren wound, land which is never satisfied with water and fire, which never says enough. Now the word barren in that scripture means sterile as if extirpated. So I had to look up extirpated. But what I found that extirpated was not in a lot of dictionaries. It was just a really old word. And so I found it in what's called the free dictionary. And it defines the verb extirpate as to wipe out, to destroy, to eliminate, to abolish, to erase, to remove, to eradicate, to excise, to extinguish, to uproot, to annihilate, to root out, to exterminate, expunge, pull up by the roots, wipe from the face of the earth. Which means that extirpated would mean wiped out, destroyed, eliminated, abolished, erased, removed, eradicated, excised, extinguished, uprooted, annihilated, rooted out, exterminated, expunged, pulled up by the roots, and wiped from the face of the earth. So we need to understand that this barren condition was not the result of an illness or a medical condition, but it was something that had purposely happened to someone. It was an attack of the enemy to destroy someone's hope, to destroy someone's uh, you know, joy in life. So the barrenness is, is more than just having a physical child. It's, it's not having hope. It's just being robbed of every sign of life in, in your life, every sign of fruit, every sign of prosperity. All of that has been robbed from you. Are you with me? Now, may, maybe we can look at our lives today and know that there are areas in our life that are barren. Areas, maybe, maybe we have experienced an all-out attack of the enemy as he's come to destroy us and to keep away from us all the blessings that God has planned for us in our lives. Or maybe we've desired spiritual fruit and no matter what we've done, it seems that we've come up empty. Nothing seems to work. We're spinning wheels. We're, we're trying everything that we know to do and nothing is happening. And you know, after a while, the hope begins to wane. There's so much more that we're believing for our lives, but it just doesn't come. Year after year after year, we wait hoping something will change until it's easy to stop hoping. Maybe you're believing for a healing that hasn't come. Same is true for our church. You know, we have believed for fruitfulness in so many areas, souls and healings and miracles and glory, increase in every area, but it hasn't come like we've wanted. The rest of the chapter is of Isaiah 54 is for you. It's for me. It's for us. Verse 1 again. Sing, O barren, you who have not born, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. So Isaiah tells the barren woman to sing. Now that's asking a lot because when, when you're dealing with problems and hopelessness, singing is not on the top of your list. Crying is more on the top of your list. Whining is more on the top of your list. But not singing. And it's interesting that singing, this word sing in the Hebrew is not just some quiet melody. The word sing actually means 
to shout aloud for joy, to cry out, to be joyful, to greatly rejoice, to make to rejoice, cause to shout for joy, cause to sing aloud for joy, triumph. So in other words, it's an effort to do what God is telling us to do, but we need to do what God is telling us to do in order to break through into what God has for us. This is not passive singing. This is not reading words off of a screen and putting a melody to it. It is, speaks of singing with every fiber of your being. Yes. There is power in the song of worship. Isaiah's word is to deal with the barrenness through worship, to enthrone God in song in order to read release his miraculous provision Amen. so sing sing with everything that's in you don't hold back Amen. you know I, I know when we come together on Sunday mornings we, we all come with different challenges you know not, you, not everybody wakes up in the morning and they're just singing a melody to the Lord and it's like floating around the house you feel so good and and your clothes just jump on you and, and, and you know, you just get yourself to church and man, it's just wonderful. You walk in, you, you're just wiped away with the anointing and you're just, yeah, yeah, God. No, I, I know we all face challenges. If you have children, sometimes it's hard to get them babies out of bed. Sometimes it's hard to get your husband or wife out of bed. Sometimes it's hard to get yourself out of bed. And things may not go right when you're getting ready in the morning. You may have some trouble with the, the kids or something. Maybe you and the spouse, something happens. And, and so you can come to church and you're just, you're tense, you're frustrated, you're whatever. Maybe you've had a bad week this past week and you're coming with the burdens of the week and it's just like the cares of everything is just resting on you. Maybe you got a big decision you got to make and you, and you come to church and it's just like, oh God, I, I need to hear a word. And so you're just so wrapped up in just trying to hear that you're not giving worship. But that's the time, every time we gather, our worship should be the most passionate I mean, we should be dancing and singing with every fiber of our being. Worship cannot be just a song service anymore. It has to be a passionate overflow of our hearts to our, our awesome God. Amen. has to be. Many of us uh, have not given ourselves to this type of worship that brings breakthrough, or not very often. You know, Psalm 22, verse 3 says, but you are wholly enthroned in the praises of Israel. God sets up his throne in the praises of his people. So you want to meet God. Worship. Amen. And if you're feeling great and everything's going great, worship for the person next to you. It's not about you all the time. It's not about me. It's about each one of us coming face to face with God and God ministering to each one of us. And sometimes we're the one that really needs it. And so people around us are just pouring out their hearts and praise to God so he can minister to us. Sometimes it's the other way around. Yeah, but the outflow of our heart has to be passion and it has to be strong and it has to come from a heart that loves God and wants to touch God. The word praise in that verse you are holy and thrown in the praises of, of, of your people. It, it's not just singing. The word praise here is the, is the Hebrew word tehillah. And tehillah is a hymn of spontaneous praise. It's a powerful praise of warfare and victory. It is a variation of another word for praise, which is halal. And tehillah is actually halal put to music. So what's halal? Halal means clamorously foolish, hilarious. To be clamorously foolish about your love and adoration for God. Speaking the glorious attributes, workings, goodness, mercy, and the love of God. How many times have we been hilarious in worship? Clamorously foolish in worship. We think more about the people that are around us than the God that we're worshiping. What if they say something? Who cares? Maybe your worship is what's going to be breakthrough for somebody in that room. 
This is the type of worship that David engaged in when he brought the ark of God back to Jerusalem. Scripture says he danced before the ark with all of his might. He danced and danced and danced. His wife saw him and she despised him for it. And he said, hey, do you think I'm undignified now? Wait. You haven't even seen me worship yet. So I don't care if your spouse thinks you're undignified. Worship God. How long has it been since you've worshiped with passion? How long has it been since you poured your heart out to God and just glorified him and just released yourself in worship? How long has it been since you rolled the care of all of the stuff off of you and just came in the presence of God and just poured your heart out and worship gladly? This type of song is what's going to take to break the barrenness and the clamorously foolish, hilarious, spontaneous, passionate form of heart praise that exalts our God is greater than the power of the enemy. So sing and sing loud, sing passionately, dance, stomp on injustice and break the power of barrenness. I just feel like God is calling us to give ourselves to real worship again to throw off the chains of indifference, quit going through the motions and really worship God. Do we really believe that God is good? Do we really believe that God is great? Do we really believe that God is more powerful than the power of the enemy? Do we really believe that God is a God of breakthrough? Do Then start worshiping like it again. Dance in the river. Verse 2, enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. As an act of faith, the barren people are to make provision for God's expansion. So make yourselves ready for the fruit that God is going to bring into your lives. Get ready, prepare for it. Don't be caught off guard and then not know what to do with the harvest. But get ready for it. Begin to expect things again. Verse 3. For you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. Neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. The maker is your husband. That means that our fruitfulness is not going to come from natural means. It's going to come from God. That means that we have to put God first. Press into his presence. No more spiritual complacency. No more spiritual laziness. Seek the Lord. Go after the things of God. Don't hold back. Are you getting the message this morning? Verse 6. I'm just going to finish reading this. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness... I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. O you afflicted one, tossed with tempest and not comforted, Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires. You women like that. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. I love this. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you will be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. Indeed, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. 
Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals on the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the spoiler to destroy. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. So listen, you have not been forsaken or forgotten by God. So grab hold of the promises again. You know, I believe it's time to quit being moved by what we see in the natural. Because our natural vision will always focus on lack, it will focus on weariness, and all the things that are against us. So we have to look with the eyes of faith. Jesus told the disciples, he said, lift up your eyes. And the reason why he told the disciples to lift up their eyes was because they weren't seeing what he was seeing. That's right. And so I believe that the Spirit of God is telling us this morning to lift up our eyes, not look with our natural eyes, look with the eyes of faith. Don't look at your life with your natural eyes. Lift up your eyes and, and look with faith. Don't look at the church with your natural eyes. Lift up your eyes and look with the eyes of faith. Faith takes us beyond what things look like and connects us with the plans and the power and the provision of God. You know, um, as I was listening to the sermon last week, Mike had a word for grandparents. And I forget exactly what the word was that he spoke. Uh, but when he shared that, I, I just heard, it, it just came up in my spirit. I heard the Lord say, that you are going to experience a new season of fruitfulness. All you grandparents in here. I'm a grandparent. I receive that. Now we're speaking spiritually in relationship here, so don't panic. I don't think any of you are believing for natural children. We're not believing for a creative miracle, right? No. No, okay. So this is spiritualness and fruitfulness but I just believe grandparents even your days are not over for bearing fruit you're this next period of time God really wants to make you fruitful to step into some new areas of fruitfulness so receive that this morning so sing O barren break forth into singing and cry aloud you who have not labored with child for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman says the Lord Look at these words because they are God's words for us this morning. Enlarge the place of your tent. Push that button. Enlarge. There we go. So we're supposed to sing to enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, but lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. God is not through with you. God is not through with us. Days of abundant fruit are just ahead of us. So grab hold of the promise and sing. Can you do that this morning? Amen. Let's have the worship group come up and everybody stand. That's this is the way we're going to close out the service. Speaking of um, fruitfulness, I want to congratulate Jeff and Krista. (laughs) 
just got the word from Linda and her husband this week. So they are expecting, I think, November? November. All right. It's fun. It really is. Nothing like having grandchildren. Except having kids. I'm not saying anything to you, but just... You don't have quite the responsibility with grandkids. It's just fun. Yes. Can we just really release ourselves in worship just for one time, one song before we go? On the wind Forgiveness like the tide Rolling in Taking up the space Where shame has lived Receiving all That you died to give Let the wind blow let the tide roll till the earth knows you're God of love. Let my dry bone sing a new song of the glory to the God of love. Dry bones Rather than moving bone to bone You breathe the breath of life into our lungs Marching on our knees we march to love Let the wind blow let the tide go to the earth goes. You're God of love. Let my dry bones sing a new song. Oh, the glory to a God of love. The dawn is breaking. Oh, lift your eyes to see. He's got a lovely dream. And everything you've lost comes returning. Your God is in the air. Oh, catch it if you can. He's moving on the wind. Oh, 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 
catch it if you can. He's moving on the wind. The dawn is breaking. Oh, lift your eyes to see. He's better than your dreams. And everything you've lost loves returning. Loves returning. Loves returning. Loves returning.
be up here. <laughs> I see ya. Give it to his mama and his daddy. Y'all come up. Come on. We got a new little guy visiting us today. And we want to wish somebody their first Mother's Day. Oh, yes. I've been just waiting to see him in person. I've seen so many cute pictures. I'm going to let them tell you his real name, and then he has a little fun name. I'm, I don't, you know, so I'm going to let you. His name is Cohen Matthias Connell. Woo! And we. How big was he? He was 10 pounds, 3 ounces. Whoa. So he's a big boy. Yes, yes. And he's one month old. Yep, as of yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And do you know my, my boy's baby, Coco? Hey. Oh, he's beautiful. Good job, guys. Good job. He's, how, much, how long were you in labor? 40 hours. Yeah, it was a, we were praying a long time. I can't even imagine. <laughs> We bless little Coco right now. We just thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you he grows up healthy and whole and strong and that is a blessing to his mama and his daddy and his whole family. And Lord, we just thank you for your goodness and your legacy to us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Children are a heritage, an inheritance. I call, I call him Cohenberger. He's only one month old. Can you believe it? He's a big little guy. But his daddy's not exactly small, so. Good job, guys. To all you moms, you grandmoms, you aunties, you sisters, have a happy Mother's Day, a very blessed Mother's Day. And again, please keep us in prayer as we go over to minister to Nellie and Sharon, okay? Love you all. Have a blessed week. <laughs>